the Path Soundbites IGTV. Keeping new music alive is what I do on the radio and now on video. Conducting live chats with the artists and learning the stories behind their latest release and also playing their new video. A special thanks to my friend Amanda Kagan of ABC Public Relations for coordinating and scheduling today's guest. With ABC Public Relations, no publicity stone is left unturned. For more information, go to the website at abc-pr.com. Special thanks today to my sponsor, GoGo Tuners. For all guitar players looking for a focus on ease of use, readability, durability, and accuracy, look no further. The GoGo Tuner is the choice of many touring professionals and a favorite of casual players. GoGo's signature green you in and red you out screen makes tuning quick and easy. For more information, go to the website at gogotuners.com. Special thanks to WBXO Classic Rock Radio Redefine, allowing me to keep new music alive on the radio airways on the Pat Show every Sunday from 5 to 8 Eastern Standard Time. Only on WBXO, Classic Rock, Redefined. And a big thank you to Mr. Evan Balzer for allowing me to use his amazing instrumental that you're hearing right now. It's called Trails. To find out more incredible music by Evan, go to his website at evanbalzer.com. And my special guest today is a songwriter, an engineer, a producer, been in the business for over 40 years. He was a founding member of the biggest R&B band in the land in the 70s, Wild Cherry. He came up with the riff for Play That Funky Music. He also was in Molly Hatchet, but now he's been the lead guitarist for the last 22 years with the legendary multi-platinum rockers Foghat. And I'm talking Mr. Brian Bassett. Fog had celebrating 50 years of rock and roll with Eight Days on the Road, a 14-track live performance that will be released as a double CD DVD package officially on July 16th on their own Fog Hat record label, all recorded right here in my backyard at Daryl's House Club in Pauling on Sunday night, November 17th in which I did the soft intro and hung out with Brian Bassett and Roger Earl backstage before the show. How cool is that? I'm going to talk to Brian about his career, his time in Wild Cherry, and Molly Hatchet, his songwriting, his recording, the course the show at Daryl's House Club, and a whole lot more right here on Pat Soundbites IGTV. Hey, live on Pat Soundbites IGTV, rocking the world, keeping new music alive is what I do on the radio and video. And my goodness, boy, what a day today. I was playing Fool for the City a minute ago. I should have actually shut off my phone. Who knows who's going to call me? But anyway, one of my favorite all-time bands, Foghead. I got this amazing uh, musician, 40 years in the business, an accomplished uh, engineer, producer, songwriter. He was in Wild Cherry. Are you kidding me? One of the biggest R&B acts back in the 70s. Then he switched over to a little Southern rock and roll with Molly Hatchet. And probably now for the last 22 years, he's been rocking with the amazing legendary platinum recording, Fog Hat. Welcome, Brian Bassett. To the Pat Show. How are you, Brian? I'm doing great, Pat, and thanks for that wonderful intro. It was great to see you. Uh, we got so much to talk about. I got to hang out with you and Roger before the show up here at Daryl's house. I figured I might as well represent both sides of the coin. Um, there you go. And I got to meet you. Actually, we met first at the um, CD release party for uh, Under the Influence at B.B. King's after That's the right. show. And... Uh, that was a great night. And uh, so, yeah, uh, Fog had, and I just got my notice from Rose a few minutes ago that my CD and DVD is being shipped today. So you need to go and get it. Pre-orders are available eight days on the road, two CDs, a DVD. And in fact, Brian and Roger will be 
talking live on the, I want to say, Rock and Roll Channel Talk Shop live tonight, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Take your questions. Talk about this great DVD and this show pretty much here in our backyard. Brian, what a great show, I have to say. We'll, we'll start off in talking about uh, bringing everybody to the Sunday night on November 17th right here at Daryl's House Club. Uh, what did you uh, think about that venue? Uh, I mean, everybody, they come in there and play. I'm not a musician, but they walk out of there going, man, what a venue. It is great. First of all, we don't get the opportunity to play a small venue like that very often. Uh, it's so intimate. People go you know, right up front where you can sweat in their salads, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the uh, they have such a professional video and sound crew there. You know, I guess it's an extension of the TV show, Daryl's House. Um, but it's his live club and the uh, meticulousness uh, that they put into soundproofing the room, setting up the cameras, and they have a big recording suite in the back. And so it was just a perfect opportunity to uh, capture it live with uh, great on-site recording engineers and video guys. And and it was uh, sort of captured our year. And I'm glad we did it right at the end of our last tour, right before the pandemic hit. So it's a nice little not you know little part in time where. Uh, you know, we get to capture the mood there and, you know, you can really see things up close and personal there because the cameras yes, are right. There. Yes, you can. I mean, every time I walk in there, I walk out with a smile on my face. I, I've had so much opportunities of introducing great bands. I did a soft intro that night and uh, pulling out my Foghat Live 1977 Foghat Live. I, I just, you know. Couldn't believe it's been. I used to have black hair. I remember going to my first fog hat show back in the late seventies, and here we are today, fifty years later, and Roger's still playing is better than ever. I don't know if it's the fog hat cellar wine or in the Long Island water. I haven't figured it out, but tell him it's keep a, doing what least he's doing. In the in the formula there, for sure. <laughs> no doubt about it, Brian. Uh, what a great night. Um, let me just start from the beginning, Brian. What got you into music? Tell me about the minute you realized, like, um, hey, this is something that I'm interested in. Was it the Beatles and Ed Sullivan? Was it Elvis Presley, Chuck Berry, a combination of them all going, well, just, I want to yeah, do that? Yeah, you hit it right in the beginning. I mean, I was a uh, you know, typical high schooler playing sports and everything, and, and really the Ed Sullivan – shows that you know that with the stones and the doors and the beatles and everything i think everybody in my neighborhood got a guitar or a snare drum or you know bass guitar i mean before you knew it the whole neighborhood was uh you know garage musicians and playing in each other's basements and you know that just that whole time period and i think for me, most musicians my age that sparked that you know that that was that creative spark that just said man i that, that looks like a lot of fun and uh, so really from about those early years on, and then, of course, Hendrix came out, Zeppelin, the Allman Brothers, and, you know, record buying. I mean, what did we have back in those days? But, you know, a nice bicycle, you know, a car if you were old enough, you know, and a stereo. I mean, so that was it, you know, board games. So, uh, you know, records and rock and roll music back then was so important to us young people. Whenever a new album came out, I'm sure you remember, you know, you went to the best stereo, you know, amongst your friends, threw that thing on there, listened to every song, read every word on the album cover 20 times. And, Absolutely. you know, it was just exciting. And, uh, and that was the spark for me, you know. I kind of missed that. I'm happy that vinyl has come back, but boy, did, I mean, you just go to the record store, like you said, open it up, look at the sleeve, look at the liner notes, look at everything, learn the music, and just play it till you just keep playing to the stylist. Why don't want to fall off? Would you say you're an uh, analog guy like me compared to this whole digital world? There's something about vinyl, Brian. You're a producer and engineer. I mean, I might not get it technically, but there's something about putting that stylus on a vinyl and hearing it compared to where we are today. You know, I'm, I guess I have a foot in both worlds because I've been an engineer since two inch tape and, you know, did 75, a hundred albums with King snake records as an engineer, all totally analog because the studio owner was a purist, you know, he wanted nothing but two microphones, two preamps, you know, old vintage uh, equipment. So, and I love that sound and sure vinyl records. I mean, that's what I grew up on. I still have several hundred in my, you know, flex room at my house, 
In fact, my and now that I have teenage daughters that are being reintroduced to vinyl, I'm bringing my old stereos out of the warehouse and resetting up my, my old stereo system from the 70s. So, and then of course, nowadays everything is digital and, you know, and they're getting pretty good at the replication of, you know, that warm sound that we all love about analog. But uh, yeah, there's something nostalgic and truly sweet about, you know, throwing on a vinyl record and dropping that needle. I pull out a cassette or even an eight track and my kids look at me like I'm sort of some sort of dinosaur going, what is that? But yeah, it is. We come, you know, I, I see both ends of it and I get it. I mean, you, you, I'm sure, you know, with Wild Cherry, even in the seventies, getting into a recording studio and working that magic. And today you can send a wave file to Roger or Charlie or Rodney or whoever, and they can send it back to you. And there's no studio time. Pretty much everybody has their own studio and, the cost, I guess, um, is what I'm saying is probably not as what it used to be back in the day. But to me, I would think I would want everybody in the room together because you could always say, hey, Roger, try this or Charlie, hit this note. Because I think you would miss the magic if you weren't together. That's just me. Well, that's exactly my point of view as well, because we record old school, even though I use digital modern equipment, we still keep that same head where we want to be in the same room i mean that's where the best ideas come in you know i can edit in pro tools like the best of them but i don't i mean if we want if we want to do a better take we you know we start from the beginning i re, you know we do very little overdubs even in our studio records you know maybe some lead vocals and some guitar solos but other than that we track as a band and i think you're right i mean that's to me the magic is that you know yeah. when you those little human mistakes and interactions and uh you know, you might get a really clean production pass and tapes around. And of course, I've done that with other artists. But but for us, we play best together, you know, four guys in a room and and try to capture, you know, the best take of, you know, and try to get that magic in a bottle. Well, you've certainly had a lot of magic. As I mentioned, Under the Influence was a great album. I don't know. There you go right there. And then you were actually produced this guy. Earl and the Agitators. What are you, number? you're Earl number two? I forgot what number you are. So, yeah. <laughs> I got to hang out with Scott after the, uh, the the CD release and learned, and I interviewed Scott. And man, you are, you actually uh, song, you were part of the songwriting of, of Love Is and Kind, which I love and we play, I play up here. Uh, Where's the Rock and Roll has been on our rotation since the, uh, since the CD, the album came out. Um, I mentioned before, producer, engineer, obviously, lead guitarist. Do you prefer, is there one role that you go, do I like to do the most? Or, I mean, guitarist, you want to feel the energy and you, I'm sure you want to play. But uh, is there, a, a you prefer a role more than the other mixer? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think I'm going to go back to my original calling, which is, you know, I'm a guitarist that knows how to work stuff, you know, in the studio. Uh, you know, there's nothing uh, that feels so good as plugging a guitar into a big Marshall amp and just letting it rip. I mean, that, you know, turned me on when I was 16 and it, you know, still, you know, flies my kite at this late date. You know, and after all these years, I just love the sound of a loud electric guitar played well with, you know, listening to other people do it and doing it myself. I just love that sound. I also love recording, you know, but it's uh, that's sort of, I guess, the mental part of my brain where, you know, I, I, I always was a tech head and I like computers and all that. So I'm very interested in that. But guitar is my first love. Well, talk and about it's funny, yeah, the Earl and the Agitators record. I mean, we were, me and Scott Holt and Roger became quite good, good friends. And uh, Roger met him first. And we just decided to come down here to Boogie Motel and do some writing for the Foghat record, really. We were just, you know, throwing some ideas around and I was capturing it. I mean, I, the way I'm set up here, I can pretty much play guitar and you know, hit my, do my recording stuff, you know, it's right in front of me. So we just came up with so many good song ideas that we had a, a bunch of overflow and that's where our Earl and the Agitators came in. Well, you know, the name came from us. We were up in Nashville uh, working with a friend of ours. In fact, uh, Scott, Roger and I uh, volunteered as guinea pigs for a good friend of ours that was in a recording academy up there. He needed a band to record. So we did a lot, a lot of those tracks were recorded up there. And, uh, but, you know, we were drinking wine after one of the sessions and, you know, well, what are we going to call this thing? We ought to put it out, you know, and I, for some reason it came, just popped into my mind, Earl and the Agitators, you know. And then the thing, I don't know if you remember the old TV show, 
you know, the Earl, you know, <laughs> I'm with Earl, sort of, you know, so we started, well, we'll just call everybody in the band Earl. That way, if somebody can't make a show, Perfect. everybody will be an Earl. So, and then we had backstage passes that said, I'm with Earl. <laughs> <laughs> And we got to mention Tony. I can't. I can't slip without mentioning Tony. Oh yeah, of course, Tony Bullard. And, Tony uh, Bullard. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, that that is. Uh, you talk about plugging in your, uh, you know, a guitar into a Marshall. Where did you come up with the riff for for this? My 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 folder's falling out. But Wild Cherry play that funky there. music. How now there's a golden oldie there, huh? Where did you I come up with that riff in the beginning? My goodness. You know, we had switched, and the song is very autobiographical. Uh, we were a rock band. In fact, we played Foghat, Zeppelin, you know, Trapeze, Rainbow, I mean, and in the Pittsburgh tri-state area. And we were quite a successful club band up there doing that. But the music was changing, you know, like we say in the song, and that KC was coming out, uh, you know, even David Bowie, you know, and and uh, uh, John Lennon, you know, had fame and and then there was the Commodores and, uh, you know, average white band. So, the, you know, the music styles were changing. The club scenes were changing more into dance clubs than they were listening rock clubs. And and someone actually did come up to our drummer and say, you boys better start <laughs> playing some funky music. You know? <laughs> basically, or you're out of a job, you know. <laughs> so so uh, our lead singer, Rob Parisi, um, basically started writing a song that night after we laughed about that comment. He wrote a lot of the... Uh, the lyrics right there and and we styled ourselves on the commodores in fact the one, it was on our first album uh commodore song i feel sanctified so it, you know that structure was bob played the the chord rhythms i played the single note funky uh licks and you know we came up with it in rob's uh dad's basement you know in rehearsal you know we put it together so you know and it was uh, one of those you know great things for a young musician holy cow you know we were playing clubs one night and and about, about two months later, we're <laughs> Don Kirshner's <laughs> rock show, Midnight Special. I got oh, to watch the video last week or getting ready to chat with you earlier uh, before we got canceled out a couple of times. And there you are. And I'm like, look at this. I, mean, I remember <laughs> Don Kirshner mid and all that Midnight Special in all those days. You used to stay up for that. You used to look forward to yeah, who's that... the latest and greatest. And uh what I loved about that show is it was actually a live concert, you know, was some of the other ones we did, Midnight Special. There was live people, and but it was more TV oriented. But Don Kirshner's was a theater, you know, somewhere in uh, Los Angeles with a full audience and, you know, just good production. So, all, you know, all those performances are pretty, you know, real. Right? That, is, that is cool. Number one hit 1976. I couldn't yeah. wait to get that 45. And, uh, you know, I, I never realized that you were in Motley, ha uh, Motley Hatchet and one of my favorite albums, If it, to me, probably one of the best albums in the band is Devil's Canyon. And then oh, I'm looking and I'm reading Bassett, Bassett, Heartless Slam and Never Say Never. And I'm like, man, Brian, a songwriter as well. So very, very cool. Yeah, I really like that song, Heartless Land. I think it's one of my best compositions. I don't write often by myself, but I uh, like to collaborate with people. And, you know, I have co-writes on a lot of songs. I work better, you know, with other people. But that one, you know, is one I'm proud of. I like that. And that album in particular, I think, is really good. You know, we, we started off with Danny Joe, but that was right around the time he got ill and passed away. And then but it was Phil. a real... And we got Phil, you know, came from the Road Ducks up there in, I think, Baltimore area. And... uh so, you know, we had great songs and we went to Germany to record that. In fact, we recorded three albums when I was with them over in Germany. And uh, it was a great band. Um, you know, a lot of good songs on there. I like The Journey, you know, as a typical, you know, long, real long guitar harmony extravaganza. So I, from a guitar standpoint, it was a lot of fun playing with those guys. Yeah, I mean, you think of Molly Hatchet and, and you know, the two, you and I can't think of the other gentleman. Uh, uh, Bobby Inc. Yeah. And then, you know, I you think of the outlaws with, uh, you know, the three uh, Florida guitar trio army, whatever you want to call Henry Paul and the guys and uh, man, Southern rock was like right there. Yes. I mean, I loved uh, Danny Joe Brown and I got to see Danny Joe up here when they played up here in Poughkeepsie at the chance. And then obviously Danny died and I got to see Phil play. I, they were up here not too long ago. Um, but I, I could not make that last show. And everybody said Jimmy, um, I can't think of his last name, uh, does a phenomenal Burrard. job. 
as well. So uh, really cool stuff. And then 22 years, uh, 1999, you joined this crazy, what a, what a cool family. I mean, from Roger and Linda and Rose and uh, everybody involved with Foghat, you know, you just feel a, a family camaraderie and uh, it's just, you know, Mark and Marco, everybody just so cool and relaxed and you just have a smile on your face and you guys jump on the stage and ba-bum, 22 years later, here you are in Foghat. Right. Were you, you always, were, were you more of a blues guy, Brian? Were you always, uh, you know, the British invasion like we talked about? You always really in your heart was more of a blues rocker? Absolutely. Yeah, that's my natural style. And, you know, because I, like you said, the British invasion, I mean, I became a big fan of the early blues guys, the American, you know, blues guys uh, that started it all, you know, Albert King, Freddie King, you know, Otis Rush, all those guys. But really, I learned about them through the British invasion. So, you know, I think really uh, the British blues rockers awakened America to their own history, really, you know, no, no and really did a lot of a lot of the original blues musicians i mean you know i remember seeing uh you know albert king like open up for deep purple i mean it was you know it brought those kind of guys to a whole new audience of young guys like me that were just you know getting the rocked up version of blues songs and then really searching out the roots the, the guy who really turned me on to really wake me up not only as a fan and somebody on this type of the music business was Billy Gibbons. I got to hang out with Billy after his show, his Easy Top show, and we just talked music. And boy, right to the blues, Billy's like boom, 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 boom. And he listed all the guys. He said, "Just go back, find time to go back to old blues, and you'll see where it's really coming from." And uh, I, I've done that, and me and Billy have become pretty cool friends. Uh, just a terrific guy to hang with. <laughs> And Lonesome Dave was that guy for me. I mean, we would spend hours on the bus, you know, like it was like Lonesome Dave's radio hour, you know, after a show, we'd be driving somewhere on the tour bus and he'd open up his briefcase and, you know, it'd be, okay, Otis Rush night or, you know, Robert Johnson or, you know, you know, he'd just have them all. And he was quite the historian and a collector of old blues records. So he was a wealth of information for me. As a songwriter, Brian, and I mentioned even some of the songs with the early agitators, Love Isn't Kind and uh, Where's the Rock and Roll, and I mentioned the others with uh, Molly Hatchet. How difficult is it for you to write the lyrics, but you're not the singer, to say to a Charlie or a Dave or a Phil what you were thinking so they because the singer has to show the emotion has to come out with it or the people he's just saying words he has to own it how difficult is that well it is difficult for me i mean i very rarely write complete lyrics but i do suggest t topics or you know moods or something you know i'm more of the guy that comes up with a chord progression or the riff and, and that's why I like to collaborate mostly with the vocalists, like with Charlie, you know, or Dave, you know, I wrote some songs with Dave or with anybody, um, you know, I, and Scott, you know, Scott was the co-writer on most of those and he wrote most of the lyrics. So it really is, I think, up to the vocalist to solidify the actual content of the actual lyric. But, you know, sometimes I might say, you know, well, this is maybe about, you know, what's being on the road or like missing your family or about, you know, a Vietnam veteran or something, you know whatever you're thinking about, you know, Heartless Land was about, you know, environmental catastrophe. And so, you know, but I come up with, um, you know, just an idea, you know, and then collaborate and work generally with the singer. And, and of course, once we get to that point, then, then it's introduced to the band and then Roger and, and, and Rodney and, um, and all of us work together on putting together the actual track, the feel of it, the arrangement. So it's sort of a three or four step process, at least, you know, from my writing uh, standpoint. You know, like I said, I very, outside of small guitar instrumentals, mostly acoustic that I write for my own enjoyment, as far as band participation, that really is a combination of collaboration. Brian, would you say that songwriting is therapeutic for, a, if not every songwriter, every musician, uh, a vehicle to get whatever it is that you want to get out and express and put it into music? I think it certainly is, particularly for prolific songwriters, you know, the, the greats. I mean, I think it's something that they have to do and they'd probably, you know, write poetry or write books if they didn't have music to express themselves with. You know, my personal expression comes out of my guitar playing. That's where I release my emotion mostly. 
Um, but I, you know, I, I think song, songwriters, and I have several friends that, you know, write two or three songs a day. They're just that accomplished, amazes me. And, but they're, but it's something that they have to do. It's, you know, an urge to write and to express themselves. And so I don't necessarily have that urge so, as much as i do to you know add to that idea you know gotcha. you know i have friends that write a lot and i you know, it's like oh let me get on in on that song you know kind of thing as a certainly an accomplished and incredible lead guitarist i've been asking guitarists you know from billy gibbon joe walsh joe satriani eric johnson how would you describe your tone brian when you're when you're playing is it uh, you know the feel that how you're feeling and then just comes out it's not so much making sure i hit every note compared to just whatever especially playing live you're just letting it go right for the most part yeah i mean i would really describe myself as a 70s era classic blues rock guitarist i mean i like that what they call the brown sound you know i like to have sustain i like to be able to turn around on my amp and have that note continue i wouldn't consider myself a fast player like uh, satriani or you know, some of the real virtuosos, Eddie Van Halen and those kind of guys. I'm not really that style of a player. So I'm more of a, you know, blues styled player where one well-placed note to me is as good as 30, you know. There you go. And, you know, and the guys that I learned from and stole from, Billy Gibbons, Eric Clapton, you know, Mick Taylor, you know, Peter Green. I mean, those are the guys that I grew up emulating and they all came from that blues rock tradition. And, you know, I think once your style sort of sets in in your 20s and early 30s, you can learn a lot of other tricks and a lot of other doodads of styles, a little bit of jazz here, a little bit of this and there. But I think, you know, your style sets in, at least it did for me early on. And, I, um, I remember uh, Billy just uh, telling me when he was hanging out with B.B. Uh, B. King, you know, take your time. It doesn't have to be fast. He grabbed Billy's guitar and he said, man, these strings are, what are you doing? Go for a lower string. Go easy, dude. You're working yourself too hard. Yeah, and Billy, too was, hard. Billy was sharing me this, this conversation. I just couldn't stop laughing. But he said he learned so much from the great B.B. Um, King. I'm not a, ge a gear guy, Brian. I'm not a guitar player, but a lot of my listeners and my friends on people that follow me on my podcast always say ask them about their guitar so brian what's your go-to guitar that you use my go -to, uh, i started out on a les paul for many years and um that was my guitar and even though i played that funky music funny enough i borrowed a strat i didn't even own one at the time <laughs> but I, so i very you know to get that clean sound but barring that particular track because i always funny enough i played a strat on the record and i always toured with a t tobacco gibson les paul you know and people go how, how did you get that sound out of a les paul i go wow well, i really didn't you know, so. <laughs> but in all the bands i played in for years it was that uh my old gibson les paul and of course when i started playing slide when i got into fog i switched to an sg which you know is a pretty typical slide guitar because of the upper neck access and uh you know the gibson sound and then I, and for many years, I played a, a Schechter Telecaster, uh, which has a, a Gibson humbucking, not a Gibson, but it has actually their humbucker in the bridge position. So it's a little hybrid between a Fender and a Gibson. And I had, I played for a long time, a 57 Telecaster that had EMG pickups in it, which, you know, makes it a little bit more beefy. And it got stolen in Albuquerque right before oh. I went to germany to record devil's canyon with molly hatch oh, no. and i went to a store in denver and i they had just had brought this guitar from the nam show i bought it got on a plane went to germany and, and that and that was uh what 96, 96 maybe that's right and i've been playing i played that guitar every year since then as my main guitar up until you know i have uh we have a guitar endorsement with diamond guitars which are great guitars but very, the one I play is very similar. You know, it's a te Telecaster bodied style. And uh, they're, they're a great bunch of people and a great guitar company. But if I had to pick one guitar to run out of a burning house, well, maybe two. It would be my old back <laughs> Les Paul <laughs> and my 96 uh, Tele. Very cool. I like that. <laughs> and obviously you play slide. You use the special slide, Rocky Mountain slide. Did I read Rocky that Mountain correct? slides. Fantastic. <clears throat> Doc Sigler is the owner. I mean, handcrafted, he makes, uh, he started out making these ceramic slides, which I love because they have the tone of brass, 
which is very warm and harmonic sounding, uh, but they're lighter. And I always play with a low action on my slide guitars and brass slides would damage my frets. It would nick them and, you know, tear up my guitar. But these ceramic ones are fantastic. And now he makes all kinds of different ones and he makes tone bars for lap steels. And uh, he's just a fabulous guy, a real artisan. I mean, these things are made like pottery, you know, baked and, and uh, you know, it's, process is quite cool and i love them i've been using them for several years now and but i've been through you know i, I get a whole drawer full of you know steel glass this and that but i've been no, nothing but the rocky mountain slides for several years now very cool with your amazing career brian 40 50 years doing what you love to do is there uh, anything on your bucket list some band some buddy you would want to produce or record with uh you know anybody out there that you go man i wish i had this opportunity you know as long as i've been playing guitar i i think my bucket list would just be getting to shake the hands of some people that i haven't met which is most of my heroes clapton jeff Beck. really you haven't met any of them guys never never met jeff Beck. <laughs> no, never met you know David Gilmore, I mean, if I had to pick, you know, I, I talk about Jeff Beck a lot because he was one of my greatest influences, but I can't play like, with, like him because he's so good. <laughs> but, you know, another guitar player that I listen to obsessively because I just love his tone and he's always meticulously crafted sounds on all of his records and live is David Gilmore, you know. So once again, someone I never met. But um, so if I had a bucket list, it would be like, you know, I'd like to go to a guitar convention and get to say hi to all these guys. Yeah, say, absolutely. Any uh, any other projects that uh, Fog Hat and yourself are working on? Is there a truth to the rumor of uh, a new Fog Hat blues rocking album uh, maybe coming out of the Boogie uh, Motel South there? Uh, as uh, yes, there is actually. We're just getting ready to do something. In fact, I got a, I just bought new mics for the drum kit over here and I turned on my board and it blew up <laughs> talking about power. Sounds like, it sounds like the album cover. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but it's long in the tooth and it's a board I've used for years. I loved it, but, uh, um, I just purchased the new board. So, uh, with a little bit of a delay, but we're, I think it's going to be along the lines of under the influence where we're going to do some old blues songs, you know, so rock up the, you know, the takes on some old blues covers and, a little of this and that. And, you know, under the influence, of course, is the influence of music, not really under the influence of no, the I, I hear you. And party. I love that. Of course, uh, it's very obvious, but it's going to be along those lines. I think we're going to, you know, do a little bit of everything and take our time to record it. And we're, we're going to start touring again, thankfully. So, uh, you know, we'll record here and there as we can. And we'll probably get together with Scott and do some more writing. And who knows, maybe another Earl and the Agitators album will fall out if we have a good writing spurt. You, but you yeah, we're looking forward to doing some more recording. You, you mentioned under the influence, and I really loved uh, Dane, my my friend Dana Fuchs down here in New York. Uh, Heard it through the grapevine was a great track that she uh, oh, yeah. helped uh, put on that. And I know you mentioned tours, Arcadia Theater. I want to say I think Saturday night you're back on the road with the band, and uh, here for folks up here in the Northeast. Uh, Huntington down in Long Island on Saturday, September 11th. The Paramount, the Big E up in West Springfield. The big fair up there, the Big E on September 19th. And Mohegan Sun at the Wolf Den on Friday the 19th. Who do I got to talk to? Where's Roger? We got to get him back. We got to get you back. to We got to make it like every year you end the tour at Daryl's house. How cool will that be? That would be awesome. We love that place. Well, uh, I got you, Brian. I just got to remind everybody, Multi-Platinum Fog Hat celebrating 50 years of rock and roll, eight days on the road, 14-track performance at Daryl's house, November 17, 2019. What a great Sunday night. Two CDs, DVD, and uh, it releases officially Friday, this Friday, Fog Hat record label distributed by Select O Hits, and uh, there's 180-gram vinyl later this summer. But you can pre-order like I did. And Rose said it will be on the way. And don't forget to catch Brian and Roger tonight. Tune in at 7 p.m. Rock and Roll Channel Talk Shop Live. Uh, that should be fun. We do it Roger together. We, yeah, we and Roger are just going to yak it up and answer some questions. And we just spent the last couple of days signing several hundred of these CDs. 
you know, <laughs> got carpal tunnel now. But, uh, you know, we're going to have a limited run of some uh, signed CDs for sale and, uh, and take fog at questions. So we're looking forward to that. That's got to be a great, great show. So I got to get off the air with you so I can get this out tonight as quick as possible. Brian, thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. I sure did, Pat. Thank you very much. We got to do it again, my friend, when the album comes out and maybe get that guy, Mr. Earl, sit and get to the sit next to you and we could really chat it up. My man, Brian Bassett, Grammy Award winner, accomplished producer, engineer, producer, Wild Cherry. Oh, my goodness. Molly <laughs> Hatchet and Foghat. Go out and buy the CD and the DVD today as you can. It's time to bring you to Daryl's house as we rock with Brian and Foghat playing the CD for Road Fever right here on Pat Soundbites IGTV. Thank you, Pat.
Thank you. Thank you, people.